Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Bridges, Dialogues Towards a Culture of Peace, initiated by the International Peace Foundation and co-organized by Thammasat University. My name is Varin Sachadeh, very honored to be your MC and moderator for this afternoon session. But before we begin with the keynote presentation from Professor Maskins, I'd like to invite on the stage for the welcome remarks. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Uwe Morowetz, the founding chairman of the International Peace Foundation. So I dig up and welcome to the six ASEAN event series, Bridges, Dialogues Towards a Culture of Peace. Bridges is uh, facilitated by the International Peace Foundation and non political and non-religious uh, foundation under the common patronage of 21 Nobel Peace Prize laureates based in Vienna. The events are hosted in cooperation with various local partners, including some of the country's major universities, and I would like to thank Tamasat University for hosting our event today. Starting this January, bridges were now being continuously held in Thailand, Indonesia, the Philippines, Singapore, and Vietnam until March, involving the participation of Nobel laureates for peace, physics, chemistry, medicine, and economics. The six ASEAN Bridges series follows the series of over 600 Bridges events which the International Peace Foundation has already hosted in many ASEAN countries since the year 2003, as an independent contribution to the Decade for Culture of Peace and Nonviolence, which was initiated and promoted by the United Nations General Assembly. The pluralistic program of Bridges highlights the International Peace Foundation's intercultural and transdisciplinary approach towards peace. The foundation does not take sides, but acts as a mediator by creating an independent platform for dialogue where representatives of science, politics, economy, culture, religion, the media, and youth can meet, share their viewpoints, listen to each other, and find mutual ways of understanding and cooperation. Therefore, the foundation itself is a bridge and a facilitator between different language groups. In our divided societies where politicians speak another language than artists and business and religious leaders, another language than scientists. In a highly interdependent world, problems cannot be solved by either one of these language groups only, but by working together. The ASEAN Bridges series comprises events with Nobel laureates from all fields. The Nobel laureates visit the region not all at once, but separately to conduct public lectures, seminars, workshops, and dialogues, hosted by local institutions during a continued pe period of several months. The topics of the ongoing events deal with the overall theme of building a culture of peace and development in a globalized world, and with a wide range of issues in the fields of politics, economy, science, culture, and the media. They especially highlight the challenges of both globalization and regionalism, and its impact on development and international cooperation. The aim of Bridges is to facilitate and strengthen dialogue and communication between societies in Southeast Asia with their multiple cultures and faiths, as well as with peoples in other parts of the world to promote understanding and trust. The events aim at building bridges with local universities in Southeast Asia to establish long-term relationships with Nobel laureates in all fields which may result in common research programs and other forms of collaboration. By enhancing science, technology, and education as a basis for peace and development, the events may lead to a better cooperation for the advancement of peace, freedom, and security in the region with the active involvement of the young generation, ASEAN's key to the future. This is why Bridges is not designed as a one-time event, but as a continuing process of synergies to make the series of events a sustainable success for Thailand and for Southeast Asia as a whole. Again, I'm grateful to Tamasat University and to our other partners and sponsors who have enabled us to make Bridges a reality. 
I would like to say thank you to everyone present today for taking part in this program. May it help us to facilitate a new culture of peace through dialogue, transcending its definition of merely the absence of war or armed conflict into a new understanding what the basis for peace is, education. In this spirit, we welcome today the 2007 Nobel Laureate for Economics, Professor Eric Maskin, who has agreed to come to Thailand to support the events. We all look forward to his important contribution and to help us build bridges. A warm welcome, Professor Eric Maskin. Thank you, Kunuwe. Mr. Uwe Morowitz, the founding chairman of International Peace Foundation. And as we all know, Thomas Hart University is a co-host. I would like to now invite on the stage for the opening address. Please join me in welcoming Professor Dr. Som Kittler Paitun, the rector of Thomas Hart University. Your Excellency, President is is Maskin, uh, Mr. Uwe Morovet, Chairman of International Peace Foundation, distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to the special lecture today. We are especially honored to have Professor Eric S. Maskin, a renowned Nobel laureate for economic research. Thank you, Professor Eric Maskin, for allowing us to have this great opportunity. Thomas Hart University and our esteemed partners are delighted to host this event in Thailand as part of the ASEAN Dialogues towards a culture of peace, which comes to the sixth edition of the Bishop series. We feel very thankful for the International Peace Foundation for initiating the series and recognizing Thammasat University in upholding this mission. Thammasat University, as one of the leading universities in Thailand, remains our commitment and full responsibility in promoting academic excellence with embeds constructive ways of thinking that can contribute to inclusive and cohesive development of our nation. To promote our mission to achieve intercultural understanding while keeping up with cutting-edge issues to interdisciplinary education, which is series fit perfectly with our efforts. We consider it great value of bringing experts and professionals in global community to our knowledge sharing mechanism. We expect that today's lecture will render benefits to all who are involved policy makers, private sector, and the public in general. Thanks for organizing committee and staff of Thammasat University, partners and sponsors for best and untiring efforts that truly contribute to the success of today's lecture. Your Excellency, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, let's enjoy the lecture. I'm confident that we will learn a lot from Professor Elik S. Maskin. His lecture on why global markets have failed to reduce inequality will be inspiring and contributing constructively for us to deepen our understanding on challenges we are facing in our global life world. I wish you a wonderful afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Dr. Som Kittler Paitun, Rector of Thammasat University. Professor Eric Stark Maskin is an American economist who, has, who was awarded Nobel Prize for Economics in 2007 for having laid the foundations of mechanism design theory and who is currently the Adams University Professor at Harvard. His current research projects include comparing different electoral rules, examining the causes of inequality, and studying coalition formation. And today, 
He'll be delivering a keynote speech on why global markets have failed to reduce inequality. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Maskin on the stage. Up in any part of the world and see fruits and vegetables and other goods from all corners of the globe. This, this is uh, a fantastic boom for consumers. But it's not just consumers who are uh, affected by this globalization. Uh, it's producers as well. And, and one very important feature of the recent globalization is the internationalization of the production process itself. That is, production has become a truly global enterprise. And let me use the example of computers to illustrate that. Uh, a computer may be designed in the US, programmed in Europe, and assembled in China. And this is just one example out of uh, literally thousands and thousands of goods which are produced uh, internationally. And that, and that internationalization of production, as you will see, is going to be a key feature of my discussion this afternoon. Now, why, why have we had this globalization? Well, it's a combination of features. First, uh, transportation costs have fallen, so it's, it's much cheaper to ship things around the world. But perhaps even more important than that, there has been a decline in communication costs. So if you are running a company based in Europe, you can easily keep track of what is going on at your plant in Thailand or in, in China. And then, of course, uh, trade barriers have been removed. So we we have ASEAN, for example, which is a, an association of Southeast Asian countries, but we also have the European Union in, in Europe. We have the North Atlantic Free Trade Agreement in North America, and so on. Now, now globalization has come with many promises. Its proponents have uh, told us that all sorts of good things will, re will result as uh, the outcome of globalization. For example, uh, it's been promised that prosperity will come to emerging economies. Now that particular promise has often been fulfilled and we have only to look at China and India to see how powerful a force for prosperity globalization can be. China and India have grown enormously over the last 20 or 30 years, primarily because of the power to export, because of the power of globalization. But there's another promise that globalization has come with where it's not been so successful at delivering, and that is to reduce the gap between the haves and the have-nots. In other words, to reduce inequality in developing countries. Uh, and there, unfortunately, uh, we have seen just the opposite occur in many, many cases. We've seen an increase in inequality due to globalization. And here again, China and India are leading examples where in inequality has gone up. Now, of course, inequality is an enormously important subject these days. There was just a surprise outcome to the U.S. election, which had a lot to do with inequality. The, the, the winner of that uh, presidential election was pointing the inequality, and in fact, that turned out to be the one of the decisive factors in the outcome. But my concern today is not with inequality in rich countries like the United States or in Europe, but with inequality in emerging economies. 
You, you might ask, why is inequality in emerging economies so important, and why should we be so disturbed by the increase in inequality? Uh, I think there are essentially three reasons to worry about inequality. The first is a moral reason. We, we believe that human beings should be treated more or less equally. Of course, perfect equality, at least in economic terms, is never going to be possible. But uh, beyond a certain point, e enormous gaps between rich and poor are morally very difficult to accept. Uh, so e our egalitarian instincts argue that uh, inequality is a bad thing from a from a uh, ethical perspective. But even if you don't accept that argument, uh, you might be concerned about poverty. Reducing inequality has a lot to do with eradication of poverty in emerging economies. And so from the perspective of poverty reduction, you might be concerned uh, about inequality. But even if you don't care about re getting rid of poverty, there's a very practical reason for worrying about inequality, and that is that countries which experience increases in inequality, particularly over a short period of time, tend to be less politically stable. We have evidence going back hundreds of years on this point, and here, again, I can perhaps point to the American case where inequality has grown very dramatically and we've uh, just had a rather earth-shattering po political election uh, growing out of that inequality. So, uh, merely from a pragmatic point of view, if you want to keep your society together politically and socially, and economically, uh, you really have to do something about keeping the lid on inequality. Now, I said that inequality has been rising in many emerging economies due to globalization. Should we be surprised by that? Well, there's a certain sense in which it's very surprising because it contradicts one of the best established principles in economics, which is called the theory of comparative advantage. This is a principle which goes back 200 years and which has an enormous amount of evidence supporting it. Uh, it was originally developed in the early 19th century by the British economist David Ricardo, and in, in instance after instance, it has correctly predicted uh, international trade patterns, changes in incomes, changes in production patterns, uh, the, as I will uh, emphasize in a little while, this is not by any means the first globalization that the world has experienced. There have been several other important globalizations in history, and for each of the previous globalizations, the theory of comparative advantage was exactly right in predicting what would happen. This is the first time that it's got things wrong. And we, um, and we should take note of the fact that the theory of comparative advantage says that free trade globalization should reduce inequality in emerging economies. Now this is such an important prediction that it's worth spending a few minutes to see why this theory, which has been relied on so heavily, makes the prediction that inequality will go down as a result of 
of free trade. So what does the theory of comparative advantage say? It says that the reason why countries are different, the reasons why some countries are rich and others are poor, is because they differ in their endowments of the factors of production. The factors of production are the inputs into the production process. And the most important input into the pr production process is labor. Some workers, some people are highly skilled, some people are less highly skilled. For now, I want to uh, divide the labor force into two groups, the highly skilled and the, and the, and the lowly skilled. Uh, and a rich country is rich because it has a higher fraction of highly skilled workers. A poor country or an, or an emerging economy is less rich because it has a much higher fraction of low skilled workers. So let's uh, compare a rich country with an emerging country. Uh, as I say, the, the rich country will have a higher fraction of uh, high skill workers. And that means that the rich country has a comparative advantage in producing goods which demand a lot of high skill inputs. For example, computer software. Uh, is, is, a, is a good where you need very highly skilled people writing the software. You don't need uh, low skilled people in the production of computer software uh, except very minimally. An emerging economy, from the point of view of the theory of comparative advantage, is particularly good at producing goods where skill doesn't matter so much. So agricultural goods often fall into this category. Uh, let's use the example of rice. Uh, an emerging economy might be particularly good at producing rice. Now to understand how globalization affects production, let's do a thought experiment. Let's look at the production patterns in the rich country and in the emerging country before globalization, before there's trade between the two countries, and let's look at production after globalization, and the difference between the two must be because of the globalization. Now what will happen before globalization occurs? Before the rich country can trade with the poor country, companies in the rich country will have to produce both software and rice because consumers in the rich country want both software and rice. The, the software and rice can't be imported, so they have to be produced in the rich country itself. Uh, and Similarly, in the, in the emerging economy, companies there will have to produce both software and rice. But there's a sense in which producing software in the emerging economy is inefficient. Why? Because the emerging economy's labor force is better suited to rice. So to the extent that... Uh, production is be being diverted into software, that's bad for low-skill workers because they, don't, they are not needed very much for software. And they're greatly needed for rice, so they would like to see more rice produced, less software. Um, if there's a lot of software being produced, that means that the demand for low-skill labor is reduced, and that means that low-skill wages will be reduced. Similarly, high-skill workers in the 
emerging economy will very much benefit from software production. But now what happens if we, we open the door to trade between the rich country and the emerging economy so, so that both sides are free to buy the goods that are produced in the other? Well, now we'll see a change in production patterns. The rich country will shift production away from rice to software because it's better, it has a labor force better suited to producing software. And it will import its rice from the emerging economy. The emerging economy will do just the opposite. It'll shift production away from software to rice and it will import its software from the rich country. So the emerging economy will now be producing more rice and less software than before globalization. This, this raises the demand for low-skill workers because they're needed uh, much more intensively for rice. And it will reduce the demand for high-skill workers because they're not much needed for rice. So that means that low-skill wages will rise, high-skill wages will fall, and inequality will be reduced. So what, I, what I've just shown you is the standard argument on behalf of globalization. This is the argument that proponents of globalization always give when arguing that emerging economies should get themselves plugged in to global markets. It will reduce inequality. But uh, this, this argument was actually correct for previous globalizations. The, for example, in the second half of the 19th century, there was a very powerful globalization. There was an enormous increase in trade between Europe and the US. This was made possible by the development of ships that could cross the Atlantic Ocean much faster and much more cheaply than before. So there was an enormous increase in trade between Europe and, and North America. Now at that time, Europe was actually uh, much worse off than today. They, they had an abundance of low-skill labor. The US had a relative abundance of high-skill labor. So uh, the, uh, the globalization of that time did exactly what the theory of comparative advantage said it should do, and it increased wages of low-skill wa workers in Europe and reduced inequality in Europe. But uh, as we've already noted, the theory of comparative advantage has been less successful for the for the recent globalization. It's actually been less successful in several ways. First of all, the theory says that the more different two countries are from the point of view of uh, their labor forces, the more they should benefit by trading with one another. Well, that's clearly not true in recent times. If you take one of the poorest countries of the world, Malawi in Africa, you see that it, it trades very little with the rich industrialized countries of Europe and North America. Theory of comparative advantage would say that they should be trading a lot because they're so different. But, the, but, they're but they're scarcely trading at all. 
But more importantly, the theory says that there should be a decrease in inequality in Malawi. And that's not what happens. So this has led me, in collaboration with Michael Kramer, who is a development economist at Harvard, to develop a, an alternative theory. We're not saying that the theory of comparative advantage is wrong. It has too much past evidence in its favor. But what we're saying is that it needs to be supplemented by something which takes account of the special features of the current globalization. And that's what I would want, that's what I want to briefly show you this afternoon. And in, in one line, the special feature of this globalization compared to previous ones is the fact that it has involved the globalization of the production process itself. So I gave that example of computers. Computers are, are produced, uh, they're, they're put together in China, but they're designed and programmed someplace else in the world with so many high-tech products, and for that matter, other products, we see exactly the same kind of pattern. And this turns out to be the key to understanding why inequality has actually gone up in so many, in so many developing countries. Now, for, for this alternative theory, we're going to need to talk about more than just two kinds of labor. Uh, we're going to have to talk, in particular, about f at least four levels. Uh, we, can, we can talk about more than four, but for, for this afternoon's discussion, four will do. Um, I want to do the same kind of thought experiment that uh, I went through for the theory of comparative advantage with this new theory, that is, I want to consider two countries. One, one country is rich, one, one is emerging, and once again, the rich country will be rich because of its, of its high skills, and the emerging country will be poor because of its low skills. But now, uh, the rich country is going to have workers of two skill levels, A and B. The emerging country is going to have workers of two skill levels, C and D, and A is higher than B, and B is higher than C, and C is higher than D. Now, this is a theory which concentrates on production. And we'll suppose that in producing goods, there are several tasks which have to be fulfilled. To make matters simple, I'm going to imagine that there are just two tasks. Uh, there's a managerial task, which highly skilled people, or pe people who are of higher skill, uh, fill. And then there's a subordinate task, which is less sensitive to skill. So you could have someone uh, of lower skill in the subordinate task. And in this world, we'll imagine that you get outputs by matching subordinates and managers. And the amount of output you get depends on the skill levels of the people whom you're matching together. I'm not sure how many of you are interested in, in uh, mathematical formulas, but if, if you're not interested, this is a good time to take a nap. 
<laughs> but if you, if you are interested, uh, we'll suppose that the output you get is equal to the skill level of the manager squared, so that means multiplied by itself, times the skill level of the subordinates. Uh, now, why did we square the manager's skill level? This is to show that output is more sensitive to the manager's skill than to the subordinate skill. The, the fact that it's squared isn't so important, but I just, I just wanted to get across the idea that output is more sensitive to the manager's skill than to the subordinate skill. Now, the theory is going to depend critically on the way that managers and subordinates are matched together. There are different ways that workers could be matched together. Let's take a simple example. Let's imagine that we have a a labor force consisting of four people. There are two workers of skill level three. We'll call those three workers. And there are two workers of skill level four. We'll call those four workers. One way of matching those workers together is that we could match one of the four workers with one of the three workers, the other four worker with the other three worker. If we did that, we would get a total output of 96 because uh, the four workers would be occupying the managerial tasks, so their skills would be squared, so it would be four squared. The three workers would be the subordinates, so we would multiply four squared by three. That gives us 48. But there are two of these pairings, so it's 48 times 2, or 96. The other way that we could match workers together is homogeneously. That is, we could match one of the four workers with the other four worker, the three, one of the three workers with the other three worker. If we did that, we would get a total output of 91. Now, 91 is less than 96, and so we would expect that the first kind of matching, what I call cross-matching, because we have different skill levels in the managers and subordinates, cross-matching will, will be adopted for this particular labor force because, it's, because it produces more. But suppose we change the labor force a little bit so that in, instead of three workers and four workers, we have two workers and four workers. So we've, the gap between the manager, the, the gap between the low level skills and the high level skills is higher than before. Well, once again, we could compare cross matching with homogeneous matching. Under cross-matching, we would get an output of 64. Under homogeneous matching, we would get a total output of 72. Now, homogeneous matching gives higher output, and so we would expect homogeneous matching to emerge. Now, for those of you who are not interested in the mathematical formulas, now is the time to wake up again, because no, no, no more mathematical formulas. But the point that I'm trying to make is that the kind of matching you get depends very much on the labor force that you're presented with. And the important thing about globalization is that it changes the available labor force. So... Let, let's apply this principle to our two countries. Remember, we have the rich country and the emerging country. Before globalization occurs, 
we cannot have international production. That is, we cannot match managers and subordinates across international boundaries. It's not feasible. It's too costly to do that. So that means that in the rich country, we'll have some matching. In the poor country, we'll have some matching. But we won't have any matching between the two countries. So in the rich country, we'll have, say, the A workers match with the B workers. In the poor country, we'll have the C workers match with the D workers. What happens when the world becomes globalized? Well, now companies can hire workers from any part of the world. They're not confined to just their own country. We'll see a change in the matching pattern. And in fact, if you look up on the screen, you'll see what the new pattern is. We'll now see the B workers from the rich country matched with the C workers from the emerging country. And that means that the D workers, these are the worst off workers, the lowest skilled workers from the poor country, are now matching with other D workers. They used to be matched at the top of the slide with the C workers, now they're matching with other D workers. And the question is, what is the implication of this new matching pattern for inequality? That, that's the big question. Well, before globalization, the D workers were being matched with other C workers. Now remember, the C workers are more highly skilled than the D workers. You probably know from experience that if you're working with someone who is more skilled than you, that improves your own productivity. Everybody wants to work with more highly skilled people because that makes them more productive. And that means that before globalization, the D workers benefited from the higher productivity of the C workers, and so D workers themselves were getting good wages from those matches. What happens uh, after globalization? Well, after globalization, the D workers don't get to match with the C workers anymore. They have to match with other D workers. That means that their wages at best will stay the same, but may actually fall as a result of globalization. But the C workers benefit from globalization because they have this new matching opportunity. They can match with B workers. The D workers cannot match with, with the B workers because the gap between the two skill levels, the D level and the B level, is too big. So it would be inefficient to, map, to, map, uh, to match D workers and, and B workers together. So the C workers see their wages rise because they have this new employment opportunity. The D workers' wages fall, and we have an increase in inequality. This, we would suggest, is what has happened in so many emerging economies. In China, the many workers who got manufacturing jobs in the city saw their wages fall, as, as saw, saw their wages rise as a result of this new matching opportunity, this new employment opportunity. The workers left behind in the country saw their wages stay the same, in some cases fall. But these, are, these are workers who are primarily working in subsistence agriculture. The gap between C workers and D workers rose. The, the wage gap between C and D workers rose. And that pattern uh, uh, it has been replicated in, in so many other countries. Now, the big question is what to do about this. What can we 
do to try to reverse this uh, huge increase in inequality. Well, one thing we one thing we might be tempted to do, and this is again uh, reflected in politics around the world these days, is to try to stop globalization. It is true that globalization increases inequality, but to try to stop globalization is probably futile, and even if it could be done, we we shouldn't forget about the fact that globalization has had such a, a powerful effect in increasing average prosperity. To, to try to undo globalization would be to try to do, undo this, this much greater prosperity that so many countries have enjoyed. So uh, trying to stop globalization is probably a mistake, but what we can do is to try to raise the skill levels of D workers so that they get to enjoy some of the benefits that the C workers have, uh, have acquired as a result of globalization. How do we raise skill levels? Well, we can do it through education, we can do it through job training. Uh, the problem, of course, is that raising skill levels can't be done for free. It's, it's expensive, and someone has to pay for it. Who is going to pay for it? Well, the, the workers can't pay for it themselves. We're talking about de-workers who are, who are very poor. Uh, they're not going to be able to afford to get themselves trained. But, but we can't expect the their employers to do it either. And that's because the employers don't have enough incentive to do it. Let, let me explain what I mean. Suppose that I'm an unskilled worker, a D, a D worker, and you're a company who is considering hiring me. You could give me some training, but once you give me that training, you're going to have to pay me more because now I'm a higher skill worker than before. So some of your investment in me will be lost. In fact, even worse than that, once you've invested in me, I can go to work for your competitor across the street and you will lose your entire investment. So that suggests that employers are not going to have enough in incentive by themselves to train de-workers. And that means that the task is going to have to be partially taken on by someone else. Uh, that someone else might be government, domestic government, it might be international agencies, NGOs, it might take the form of foreign aid, even private foundations, but the point is that someone has to do it. It's not going to happen automatically. Left to just market forces, inequality is going to increase, not decrease. So what is the, what is the conclusion from all of this? Well, let me say once again, the, the, the conclusion is not to try to stop globalization. Globalization is, is, has too many other benefits to try to, to bring an end to globalization, even if we could. The, the right moral of the story is to try to spread the fruits of globalization, the benefits of globalization, more equitably. And the way that we do that is to bring the de-workers into the global community. And with that uh, recommendation, I will stop and, uh, and I'd like to thank you for your attention this afternoon. Thank you, Professor. And now uh, I would like to open the floor for any uh, questions or any comments from 
the audience. I'd like to uh, request for you to uh, first introduce yourself, uh, followed by the question, if you have. And uh, we have about half an hour for this uh, Q&A. Yeah. Yes, please. Good afternoon. My name is Somkia Tanket Benish from the Thailand Development Research Institute. Um, I would like to ask uh, two related questions. The first one is about the sufficient condition for your results to hold true. And the second, which is related, is that suppose that we are entering, not, not actually supposing, it's, it's going to be real, that we are going to have robots and computer that can multiply um, itself. Um, so um, the um, robot would be um, worker B um, because it's not the top doesn't have creativity as num uh, worker A, which is still human. Um, but it can multiply itself, so there are infinitely many Bs. Um, in, in your model, um, then B would not be limited, so um, A would, the, the result would change in the sense that A would uh, group with B to maximize their output and um, there would not be so many um, cross-border matchings. Would that be the case? V very interesting question. Uh, it is true that, that robots already, and to an increasing extent in the future, will take the form of reasonably high-skill labor. But that doesn't mean that human labor will become obsolescent. Uh, remember the theory of comparative advantage. The theory of comparative advantage says that it's only your relative advantage that matters. It may be that some other country is, in an absolute sense, better at producing every good than you. Uh, there will still be a comparative advantage, a relative advantage, in producing goods in your country which are, which are well suited to that country. So with the, with the increase in uh, robots, it will still be worthwhile matching humans with other humans, humans with robots. Uh, however, the wages that those human workers will be receiving uh, are likely to be uh, reduced as, as a result of, uh, of the robots. So that magnifies the policy argument. If human workers are lower skill and we're cutting off their opportunities to match with higher skill workers because those higher skill workers are, are now uh, repl replicable Robots, uh, human wages will fall unless we can somehow raise the skill levels of those human workers. So, so the policy implication that I was stressing before, increase education, increase job training, will be even stronger. It, it will be even more important in a world... Uh, of robots to, to increase skill levels to make sure that 
wages uh, continue to deliver uh, a reasonable standard of living for, uh, for lower skill workers. In other words, robots will enhance the argument I'm making, not, not detract from it. Let, let me make one other comment. Um, and this again is based on historical experience. Back in the late 18th century, when the Industrial Revolution was uh, getting going, people worried that their jobs were going to be taken over by machines. They didn't have robots in those days, but they did have new machines, like the cotton gin and the printing press and later the, the assembly line. Uh, in fact, there was, there was a, a movement called the Luddite movement of workers who tried to stop machines from getting adopted because they, they worried that this would be the end of, of human labor. That didn't happen. Uh, in the end, entrepreneurs figured out how to use these new machines to match them with workers so that the workers as well as the entrepreneurs were better off than before. And in the 19th century, thanks to new technology, we saw the fastest increase in human wages that we had ever seen in, in history. Well, we don't know yet what is going to happen with new technology, but if the, if the old technology, the technology of the first industrial revolution is any guide, uh, we have to believe that this new technology will not drive out human labor and will not reduce human wages, but will eventually allow human workers to work more efficiently with machines and, and, and be more productive. This is, to some extent, speculation, but it's speculation which is informed by historical experience. Thank you. Yes, please. My name uh, is Mary Cronkell, formerly at oh, Thomas Art University. Sorry. sorry. Okay. <laughs> Can I speak okay. first? Yeah. Okay. Uh, now at NIDA. Um, in your country, United States, in about 10 days, you're going to have a new president by the name of Donald Trump. Right. <laughs> uh, we know that he's trying to stop globalization, at least slow it down. I wonder if you can share with us your opinion or thought on how this change of policy would have effects on inequality in the U.S. and inequality in the world. Thank you so much. Well, uh, uh, let's assume that Trump is successful at... Uh, I, I, he may not be, because to, uh, to reduce trade is not something that presidents can do unilaterally. In the uh, American uh, political system, president has to get the consent of, of Congress, and, and there are many members of Congress who have already expressed great skepticism for, for interfering with trade. But let, let's suppose that he were successful. Uh, the major consequence uh, of interfering with trade would be to interfere with growth. It, it's 
globalization, as I was saying at the beginning of my talk, has been responsible for an unprecedented growth, both in, in developing and in rich countries. To, to, to stop globalization is... It, the, 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 the first effect is going to be to interfere with growth. Now, that means that there's going to be a smaller pie to, to divide up. Now, it's true that perhaps a bigger share of that smaller pie might go to unskilled workers. That, that, that's to put us back in the pre-trade framework that, that I was talking about in the, uh, in the talk. So, so you might actually reduce inequality, but at, a, at an enormous price, which is to shrink, to shrink the pie. I think a much healthier a, a, uh, a better outcome for all is to allow the pie to grow, but just to try to divide it in a fairer way. And, and, and one, one way to do that, as I was suggesting, is through, is through education and job training. So that, that's the direction that I hope the new president ends up taking. Sorry? I don't think he'll be terribly successful. No, I think, there, I think there's going to be enormous opposition. But, 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 we'll, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. In any case, I hope that he's not successful. <laughs> we'll soon find out. Yeah. In fact, I was about to ask the same question. Uh -huh. But then uh, let me twist it a bit. Uh, do you think uh, Tom would be Keynesian, uh, meaning uh, would be uh, able to use the budget uh, to pump, pump the U.S. economy? That's my, my uh, first uh, question. I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch the, qu the do, question. Do you think t Mr. Trump yes. would be able to uh, make use of fiscal policy to reverse the situation at the moment in the U.S.? Uh, namely to pump the economy uh, instead of mm -hmm. using uh, solely monetary policy. Yeah. But I'm more interested to, to hear your view on this category A and B in the U.S. How would the B group be able to change themselves? Because apparently the latest uh, election outcome was because of the uh, dissatisfaction yeah. by the poor in the U.S. about the political uh, outcome. Okay, well, on your, on your first question, uh, can the new administration use fiscal policy to help stimulate the economy? Uh, in principle, the answer is yes. And, and actually, this is one of the few policy proposals by Donald Trump, which I think actually might be good, not just for the US, but for the world. Uh, Trump has proposed undertaking an enormous investment in infrastructure, which I think is actually a great idea. Now, he hasn't said how this is going to be financed, which is a major uh, question to be resolved. But assuming that that can be done, and assuming that the project, the infrastructure project can be undertaken, that, that would be a, a positive developments, un unlike the uh, trade policy which, uh, which Trump has suggested. Now, the, the, the second question had to do uh, with um, dissatisfaction that was being expressed uh, in the U.S. about increasing inequality. I, I think, frankly, that that dissatisfaction is, was highly justified. The U.S., I, so my talk has been concentrating on developing countries, but exactly the same increase in inequality has been taking place in, in rich countries like the U.S. too, and, 
which means that although globalization has been a great idea on average, the benefits of globalization have been disproportionately shared. Um, and the, the lesser skilled people haven't seen enough of those benefits. In some cases, they've been left out of globalization pretty much altogether. But remember the policy implication. The policy implication is not to try to stop globalization, which is what Trump is promising to do, but to, to get more people into the globalized world. So, so rather than stopping globalization, what is needed in the U.S. is our retraining program so that the coal miners who have lost their jobs because of shifts to other forms of energy can find new opportunities in, in some other sector. This, that's what happened in the 19th century. A lot of jobs were lost in the 19th century, but a lot of new jobs were created. And uh, as a result, inequality fell. If we, if we had the right policies in the U.S., education and training policies, the same thing could happen again. Thank you. Um, over there first, and then we'll come back to you. Yes, please. Thank you. Hello. Uh, can you hear? Okay. Uh, my name is Nat Pinoid. I'm an independent researcher. Uh, my question is not on your, on your theory, but basically focused mainly on your, your policy implication. Um, I understand that a lot of government in emerging countries already put a lot of effort in retooling their labors and improve their capacity skills. But how come we still see these increasing inequalities? So there must be something that we can do even better or even more than, uh, than just retoolings or building the capacity. And related question to that, what would be the incentive of the government actually to do uh, this, um, to build more capacity for the labor or the delay labor? Thank you. Well, I, I, the answer to your first question, uh, you, you were asking why, in spite of government's efforts, do we still see so much inequality? Uh, I would suggest that that government is not doing enough. Uh, they're, they're do they're, I'm not suggesting that they're not doing anything but they're not doing enough. And, and when I say they're not doing enough, that often means making more creative use of the resources that they already have. Let, let, let me give you an example of a creative idea that was used very successfully in Brazil. Now, now Unfortunately, Brazil has got itself into a terrible political mess at the moment, and so it's somewhat non-functional. But a few years ago, uh, this, uh, this policy worked very well, and it's called conditional cash transfers. And, and the idea of conditional tra cash transfers was to transfer money to poor families. That's something that many countries do. The poor families could use the money, but the transfers were made on condition that those families sent their children to school. That was the creative part, because simply transferring money is only a short-term fix. You, you, you help the, the poor families, but you only help them as long as you continue to pour money. Uh, toward them. You don't, you don't solve anything for the long, in the long run, but if you make the money conditional on their children getting an education, those children can then, when they get to working age, go out and get reasonable jobs. And that means that you're making an investment in the future when you give a conditional cash transfer. That simply making uh, a redistributive grant 
doesn't accomplish. So it's that kind of create... And, and I should say that in Brazil, which historically has had very high inequality, they were seeing uh, impressive results over the last 15 years in reducing inequality. So, so the policy was working. That's the kind of creative thinking uh, that, uh, that I, I think we need more of. You, you, not necessarily vastly increasing the amount of money being spent, but spending it in a, in a more effective way. Now, the second part of your question is why, why should government care about inequality? Well, I think, I think uh, uh, Donald Trump, <laughs> who, is the an who has been the answer to many questions today, is the answer to that question. Again, if, 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 if you don't do that, if, if you don't pay attention to inequality, you get Donald Trump. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Same cup. Hi, Professor Maskin. My name is Gon. I'm a politician, former finance minister. Um, I have a question. Your, the title of your talk, Why Global Markets uh, Has Failed to Reduce Inequality, um, the way I understand your delivery is that the markets haven't failed. Um, but uh, in fact, what we, because you're suggesting is that we train the D workers so that they stop producing rice and start making more computers, and that way they oh, generate... Oh, no, 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 no. Well, well, uh, <laughs> no let, let me finish my question. Okay. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and of course, uh, providing great education to the less skilled is something that none of us here is going to argue about. Um, but uh, my question to you is, uh, surely the world needs rice as well. Um, and perhaps uh, the reason why there is a problem, i.e., those that are making rice are not generating the level of income that we'd like them to be generating, is a failure, in fact, of the markets. The question, therefore, is, is it inevitable that computers will always be valued more than rice? Um, and, and perhaps the solution might lie in addressing market failure, um, as well as supply-side issues, yeah. such as uh, retooling yeah. and retraining. Thank you. There, very good question. Uh, let me first emphasize that I'm not at all suggesting that D workers be retrained in order to produce computer software. In fact, they might be retrained to produce rice but there are many different ways of producing rice. You can pr produce rice according tr to traditional subsistence farming methods, which leave you at subsistence level. You can also use modern agricultural techniques, which give you a much higher yield than before, and which allow you to sell a lot of that rice and, and earn a higher income. It's, it's the, it's the uh, move toward modern techniques that I'm arguing for. It, uh, you don't need to produce more software engineers to Im improve the economy. You might continue to have lots of people in agriculture, but they will be using uh, methods, highly skilled methods, uh, to get higher yields from their, uh, from their crops. Now, is there a market failure involved? Uh, you're right, there is. The market failure is that the retraining doesn't happen through market forces alone. Someone, the government or NGOs, or somebody has to step in to facilitate this retraining. And, and the, you know, to, to use uh, 
uh, to use the the economics jargon, there there's a market failure in the capital market. Uh, if if there were perfect capital markets, I as a D worker could go into a bank and get a loan which would enable me to retrain myself so that I could be more productive. I can't do that. D workers can't do that in practice. Uh, they can't get loans using their future productivity as the collateral <laughs> against those loans. So someone has to step in and may help them make that investment. That's the market failure. And that's, and that's why uh, we need governments or NGOs to, to, to help in the process. But a uh, very good question. Thank you for the question. I can go on and allow me to move back to this side. Yes, please. Um, yes, hi, Professor. My name is Ratana Lau. I'm from Thammasat University and in SNBC International. Um, as an educator, I'm very glad that you touched upon the importance of education. Specifically, I'm interested to hear your opinion of how public schools, both in the United States and in Thailand, can move forward with limited resources. And in, a very, in every school, there is B, C, D skilled workers within it. How do we enhance individual skills without enhancing the social exclusion within it? How do we enhance How we enhance the skills, skills of each individual within the right. school without widening the gaps that already existed within it? Well, first, on, uh, on the value of public school education, I probably should not say too much about public schools in Thailand because I like to talk about things that I have some expertise on. And although I have a casual acquaintance through having visited Thailand before with with education here, I don't really know enough about it to to make a a, a detailed comment. But I have a lot of uh, familiarity with American public schools which historically uh, made an enormous contribution to American productivity. In public schools uh, were probably the most important reason for the rise of the United States as the leading innovator in the world because so many more young people became available as potential innovators. I'm very worried about the path that the U.S. has been taking in recent years where much money that used to be put into public schools has been diverted into the private sector. I have nothing against private schools, but private schools will never serve as many people and as many people who would like to lift themselves out of poverty uh, as, as public schools. So. So public schools, I think, are the key to America's future, and I would guess probably the key to, to Thailand's future, too. Uh, how do we restore the effectiveness of public schools? Well, one thing that we can do is to implement policies which get more of our best and brightest into the teaching profession. It, it's, um, it's been well documented that even in a even in a public school from a low income area with very little by way of physical resources, 
if, if you can get a good teacher, a bright, young, committed teacher into that school, the effect on students can be enormous. They, uh, economists like to measure things by, uh, by looking at incomes. The, the, the effect that a good teacher can have on a, on a student's lifetime income is in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. I mean, a, a truly spectacular effect. Getting more good teachers into the system is, uh, is critical. We, 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 uh, teachers, when, when, when I was a, a student, uh, we used to have PhDs going into public school teaching. I, I, my biology teacher had a PhD in biology. That doesn't happen much anymore. But there's no reason why it couldn't happen. It, it's, a, it's a matter of policy. Thank you very much. Thank you. And unfortunately for Thailand, I mean, public school teachers is, are the, uh, the least desirable uh, job. <laughs> but, but again, that's a matter of policy. We, <laughs> can, we can make public school teaching more attractive yep. by by spending our limited resources mm -hmm. more effectively and on more teachers. Incentives. Yes, yeah. thank you. Um, yes, please, we have... Okay. Um, at the back first, yes, you. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Niwan from Faculty of Economics, Tamasa University. Uh, I, I would like to ask you, how would we deal with uh, inequality in the era of a AI, it, artificial intelligence? Uh, for, for example, uh, we, we recently have some, some shop like Amazon Go where we don't use any shop, shop clerk, shop worker to do yeah. register work. Register work, you just tap, tap and go, tap and go. And if we adapt this care to Thailand, uh, if we can totally replace subordinate the worker with the machine, with, with the machine, for example, banker will, will be no needed. We use ATM, cash machine, even even uh, approval loan might be using AI or call center using AI. So how, so how do we deal with inequality besides from uh, retraining? Yeah. Because we we can we can put the seven. For example, if a mechanical engineer is, is highly needed, we can retain these seven, eleven workers into the mechanical engineer right away. Thank you. This, so that, that's, that's a good question. Um, and to answer it, let me go back to something that I talked about a little while ago, which is the first industrial revolution, the, the industrial revolution which occurred in the late 18th and early 19th century. At that time, people were expressing the same worry that you've just expressed, that machines would replace human labor because machines were so much more efficient than, than human workers. And, and didn't have to be given vacations and, and other no, inconveniences yeah. <laughs> like that, sick days. Well, that's not what happened. What, what happened was that after a period of time, it took 30 years or so, but after 30 years, entrepreneurs figured out new jobs for human workers that would complement the new machines. So in other words, these new machines were enhancements of human labor, not substitutes for human labor. No one can forecast for sure what is going to happen in the coming years with the new technologies that are being developed now. But if historical example is any guide, Clever entrepreneurs will figure out ways of making, of creating new jobs which will allow human workers 
to work side by side with, the, with, with these machines as well. In which case, uh, the, the worry that we will all be replaced by machines, I think, is uh, far, far uh, too pessimistic. Uh, uh, now, can I guarantee that that will be the outcome? No, but uh, but uh, you know, none of us can really predict the future. Uh, all we can do is to try to draw lessons about the future from from the past. Let let me say one other thing about this, though, which is that if in the if by developing new machines we allow human beings to have more leisure time, more time freed from unrewarding drudgery, that's probably a good thing too. So, so getting rid of some of, the, some of these current jobs is probably not such a bad idea in the long run. A lot of people probably work far too hard at the moment. It wouldn't be so bad to create a world where they didn't have to work so hard. Does vacation mean unemployment? I'm sorry? Does, does more vacation mean more un unemployment? Because, because during the time in replacing. <laughs> uh, I, what I'm proposing is that we all work a bit less. <laughs> so, so that the, don't forget that um, the work week in Europe in the 18th century was about 60 to 70 hours a week. It's now down to somewhere between 30 and 40 hours a week. If it went down to 20, that wouldn't be such a bad thing either. <laughs> Thank you for the question. And trust me, I'm not, not sure about you, but I still love human touch. <laughs> I try to uh, minimize you know, the app usage and uh, Yes, technology, please. Um, we have time for a few more questions. I'll go for this one. Yes, Chen Krapatan. Thank you very much. Uh, from your presentation, it seems to me that globalization underlying certain assumptions will raise our standard of living of people around the world. Now, it seems to me that the emphasis on economic development theory so far seem to emphasize too much on the quantitative aspect rather than qualitative aspect. You mentioned something about growth. Even globalization can assure continuous and reasonable high economic growth rate throughout the world, but yet, it will not be sustainable anyway. So my question is this, that whether quantitative improvement, improvement imply qualitative improvement as well, or yeah. more is better than less assumption still can hold that apply to human being as a whole. Now, if we look at the world 100 or 200 years from now, what would happen? Because now even human beings try to find other sources of resources in other planets because soon resources on this planet will be exhausted. So my question is that is more better than less is a good philosophy to pursue? Thank you. Very, very good question. Uh, <laughs> And, and economists probably are guilty uh, of, <laughs> of the idea that more is always better. In fact, we know, we know from uh, important psychological work that more is not necessarily better. Uh, there, there was, there, there's some interesting work done by Daniel Kahneman and his colleagues showing that starting from very low income levels, happiness increases with income, but only up to uh, what, what in the U.S. we would call 
uh, lower middle class levels. <laughs> and beyond that, it makes very little contribution to happiness. Uh, that's, that, in fact, is one of the reasons why I was motivated to talking about inequality in developing countries, because there, we're talking, these D workers that we're talking about really will benefit from having their incomes level, their incomes rise. They're, we're talking about uh, people who are living at the subsistence level. Allowing them to earn more income is certainly a good thing. Uh, but beyond a certain point, it's not more income that's better, it's how we use that income that, that makes the difference. And actually that, that connects with uh, both question you were asking and the one that the previous uh, question was asking. Of course, we're not going to be able to grow exponentially forever. There are, there are finite limits to our resources. Uh, and with machines doing more work, we may, as individuals, be do doing less work in the future than before. But with, the, with all of the uh, new free time that these machines will give us, we'll have the opportunity to enrich ourselves in other ways. That is, by uh, cultivating an interest in, in the arts or in... Uh, in sports or in something which is fulfilling other than work. Uh, too many of us think of ourselves first and foremost as workers. We're, we're, we're all more than workers and, and we, we all have lives which uh, extend well beyond the workplace. Uh, one benefit of new technology may be to remind ourselves that work is not everything. In other words, life can be a vacation. <laughs> <laughs> I will apply the same philosophy. Less questions are more beautiful than more questions, so we only have time for one last question. Uh, one last question, yes. Chen Krap. My, my name is Don Nakontap. I work for the Bank of Thailand. I studied Act 2010 with you about 20 years ago. Uh -huh. And uh, your model today uh, reminds me of the old days. It's nice, simple, and intuitive. <laughs> uh, in the U.S., when you talk about in the rising inequality, we, we talk about skill bias, technological changes. Right. Uh, conceivably, the same thing may be applying to India and China as, as well. How, how do we distinguish between the two theories? Because they may have different impl policy implications. Well, uh, one interesting feature of the, of the theory that I was outlining is that it, there was no technology at all. <laughs> and so the point that I was making is that even without technological change, you can have increasing inequality due to globalization because of, of a realignment in the way that workers are matched with one another. If on top of that, you put what, is, what economists call skill bias technical change. Skill bias technical change means that with new technology, people with high skills become more productive, but people with low skills do not. That, that only amplifies the effect that, that we're talking about here. But uh, the reason I left the technology out was because that's more controversial. And even without it, the 
theory can explain the, uh, the increase in inequality that we've observed in developing countries. Thank you. We truly apologize. Uh, there are more questions, but uh, Professor will still be with us at the reception, yeah. and we have a press conference uh, outside as well. So please give a big round of applause for Professor Maskins. And I'd like to invite the Rector of Thomas Hart University uh, to present the bouquet and the uh, token of appreciation to uh, Professor Maskins. Oh, thank you. That's lovely. <laughs> And may I also invite Mr. Uwe, a Chancellor Dean of uh, Faculty of Economics at Masaj University, a Chancellor Richard Sud, former rector of Masaj University, on the stage for a group photo. For everybody who registered for this event, uh, before you leave, um, make sure that you uh, pick up two booklets on Ajahn Poe on your way out. Uh, it's actually uh, published by PSDS, Poe School of D Development Studies, a gift from Thomas Hart University. May I also invite uh, vice rectors from Thomas Hart University to join uh, the group picture on the stage. Thank you. Ajahn Nithinan, Ajahn Kesini, Krap. Ajahn Pramuan, Krap. Set. You're all welcome to uh, join the reception outside. Some refreshments will be served. And on behalf of International Peace Foundation and Thomas Hart University, once again, I'm very honored to be uh, the MC and the moderator for this afternoon session. As a very proud uh, alumni of Faculty of Economics, Thomas Hart University myself, uh, it's an honor to be here today. Thank you very much. Kapoor Krap.